from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nicholas Brown, and it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Music Division of the Library of Congress to this evening's presentation and the wonderful Whittall Pavilion here in the Jefferson Building. Uh, tonight, we are celebrating the musical worlds of Victor Herbert. And the first component of our celebration is this wonderful talk, which features Alice Mott and Loris John Schissel. Uh, these are two of the, the key figures in uh, resurrecting Herbert's legacy and music in the world today, and we are so thrilled to have them. And uh, of course, Loris is with us in the music division, so we get his, uh, his presence every day, which is very fun. Um, just to give you a brief introduction to, to both Alice and Loris, um, Alice is a distinguished librettist and stage director. And she first came to the library in 1994 to work on Herbert things through uh, Wayne Shirley, who was a longtime member of the music division staff. Uh, she has written new libretti for various Herbert operettas, including Babes in Toyland, uh, The Fortune Teller, Sweethearts, Naughty Marietta, and Eileen, as well as several others. Um, a lot of the productions that Alice has uh, created uh, took place at New York's Lincoln Center, and certain Stars of the stage have participated in those such as Sally Ann Howe, Estelle Parsons, Lynn Redgrave, and Patrice Munsell. Uh, Alice also co-created with Dino Agonost the Victor Herbert Renaissance Project, and she has also created the website vhsource.com, which makes online digital original Herbert performance materials available at all times throughout the world. And Loris is a wonderful musician and conductor, and obviously staff member here at the library. He has been with the Cleveland Orchestra as a conductor since, the, since 1998, uh, performing regularly with them at Severance Hall and also at the Blossom Music Center, their summer festival. Uh, Loris is also the founder and music director of Virginia's Grand Military Band, and he is a composer and arranger with a prolific output of over 400 published works, and over 200 compact disc recordings, and his film scores have been heard regularly on PBS and in films at the FDR Presidential Library in New York. Loris is also a regular uh, commentator on NPR, The Voice of America, and the BBC. And just a little plug for his recent book, uh, was a, a, a book about John Philip Sousa's life and legacy, which was co-authored with John Philip Sousa IV. So we're so pleased to have these two brilliant experts in music here this evening, and we hope you enjoy their talk. Let's test. Can you hear us if we talk it about this one? In the back, too, you're okay? Give it Let's a try. see. Uh, uh, testing one, two, three. Is that wonderful? Good. Wonderful. <laughs> well, just to get things started, outright, just a little background on Herbert here at the Library of Congress. The music of Victor Herbert, his manuscripts and his papers and such, started coming here shortly after he died in 1924. Just a month or two before he passed away, the chief of the music division at that time was Carl Engel, uh, who wrote to Herbert on a, another question. He was trying to find a phone number and address for someone. He said, by the way, Mr. Herbert, I was just looking on our shelves, and we have none of your manuscripts here. You need to correct that problem. And so Herbert wrote back and said, I'd be glad. Once I get this show done I'm working on, I'd be glad to give you some of my manuscripts for your collection down there. So he died just a month or so after that. And in all the years after that, his wife and then his daughter and then the estate of Victor Herbert over the years have been donating manuscripts to the library up until the present time, basically. So there's no one curator of the Victor Herbert collection. There are a series of people who have been sort of caretakers of the Herbert legacy, and probably the most famous of our caretakers was the former chief of music division, who some of you may remember, Ed Waters, who was our chief here uh, our assistant chief for many, many years, and then our chief. And in the 1940s, he, he looked on the shelf and realized there had been not a, a, a good biography done of Victor Herbert. Um, and it was unusual because Ed's big passion was the music of Liszt, 19th century romantic piano composer. And everyone sort of scratched their head, what is it about Victor Herbert that Ed finds so fascinating? And uh, 
And so Ed wrote the definitive biography, and it's interesting, that book came out in 1949. 56. 56. 56. He wrote it in 49, yeah. and then spent four years trying to get it from this big to about this big for a regular publisher to publish it. And except for a few things that Ed didn't have access to at that time, it's still, if you think about it after all these years, the definitive biography of Victor Herbert, if you want to know something about yeah, it's a my fact. Bible. Yeah, it's my Bible. Yeah. And you can, if you're looking, if you have a question about Victor Herbert, if you go to the Ed Waters book and look in the index, there it is. And that's You'll because every, that's all librarians look at a book, the first thing they check is the index and they say, oh, this is good, this will be a good book. So that said, just a little, because Alice has been so instrumental in in keeping Herbert in front of the public eye. Most of us know him through a few shows, maybe Babes in Toyland that you remember with Laurel and Hardy, um, some of these sort of film versions of his shows that are not terribly close to the original, <laughs> and like all like things all Holly do it. That's right. Films. Yep. And Nelson especially, they're not, almost in there, most of them are pretty dull. Yeah, they were kind of cobbled together, but they were great tunes. And so, so most of us know him, but you know, Victor Herbert was an Irishman through and through. I think if you cut him, he'd bleed green. He was born in Dublin. His, his grandfather was Samuel Lover, who was a great, we don't know that name much, but in Ireland he's considered one of the great poets and painters and authors and folklorists and that. He grew up in that family. Like all good musicians, he was sent to get a proper training in Germany in composition. And by the time he left Germany to come to the United States, he was really one of the great cellists, uh, traveling with different orchestras. The orchestra of Johann Strauss's brother, Edward, played for various kings in their court orchestras, and that started composing, married a lovely girl named Teresa Forrester, who was an opera singer, and uh, came over because she got a job with the Metropolitan Opera, and he got his first job playing first cello in the Met Orchestra in the pit there. And it was at that time that uh, a few forays into being a bandmaster, into being a conductor, a cellist, a composer of serious music, but then he starts writing his musicals. And that's where I'm going to turn it over to Alice because she's forgotten more about these shows than most people <laughs> know about them. So, so t tell us about, uh, about Herbert in his time you know, as a, comp a Broadway composer. Well, he, I like to say, I always like to ask people, why should we care about Herbert? Herbert is a game changer. There are, the, you know, the, the American population has the biggest entertainment world in the world. What we do affects the whole world. And we, that whole world was built on the shoulders of about six or seven people. Um, one of them being Victor Herbert. And Victor Herbert, probably more than anyone else, determined where the modern world of entertainment was going. What was the date of this first show? Pardon? What was the date? 1894, Prince, Prince Ananias was the first show. The interesting thing about Herbert and his operetta writing was that he sprung forth fully conceived with mm -hmm. a successful show. It was produced by the Bostonians. Um, it was a hit, and from there he went on. Um, I'm up to examining number 43 this month. It's 1920, it's a show called The Girl in the Spotlight, which you probably never heard of, but that's number 43. It's taken me, I started walking through them in um, July of 2009, and that's taken me, that's 43 months ago. Um, I'll be finished sometime next year. But let's get back to, to why you should know about Victor Herbert. He was first and foremost a performer. Loris talked about him being a cellist. He was also an incredible pianist. He accompanied Emma Jukes. Emma Jukes is a, is a um, 18, late 1880s, early 1890s singing star who did salon um, performances. She toured the country. And he was her music director, and he played. 
Um, and there been a, were several occasions where he was still way late into his life, long after he stopped, he stopped really being a performer, where he was still being asked to accompany singers. So he was a fine pianist, an incredible cellist. He was our Pablo Cassell. Um, there's a guy in Boston, and I never remember his name conveniently, but he, he probably would have challenged that a little bit. But Herbert was the premier cellist. He and... Um, who was it we were just talking about, the Brahms? Um, oh, the that. Brahms Double Concerto was given its American premiere here in the United States with Victor Herbert on cello and Max Fiedler, uh, no relation to Arthur and the Boston Pops. They did the American premiere of that piece here. And they insisted on doing it from memory, and they insisted on growing their beards until they had it mastered. Mastered. So I'm sure they, they were very through. hairy when they did the actual performance. <laughs> but um, he was, so he was first and foremost a performer. Then he was a composer. He was a composer before he got here. There's a wonderful piece called um, Royal Sec, Pol which was written Polka. in 1887-88. And it's a, is a precursor of the Champagne Gallop in uh, Hello, Dolly. You're all familiar with that. Well, this is the same kind of thing with the percussionist asked to have popping champagne corks and tinkling glass through the whole thing. It's a wonderful piece that um, has been restored, and uh, orchestras um, are, are asking for it a lot. Um, he composed band music. He composed orchestral music. He composed German leader at least 19 examples of German leader for Emma Jukes and her, her um, group. Um, 40, I'm thinking it's probably somewhere around 45 to 46 operettas, all of which were produced on Broadway. One grand opera, two one-act operas, um, film scores. He was the first composer, American composer, to write a complete film score from beginning to end with original music. It's called The Fall of the Nation. It was 1911. And he showed the rest of the composers that, wow, golly gee, you could make a living composing for film. Um, let's see, what else in the way of composing? Song. The man had a touch for melody that you will hear tonight that was absolutely incredible. And keep in mind as you listen tonight that Irving Berlin grew up listening to him, as did Richard Rodgers, as did Jerome Kern. They all grew up listening to Herbert because Herbert was turning out melodies starting in 1894 vocal melodies. He was the first one to say, you know, I bet you we can sell these songs. And he started from Prince Ananias in 1894, and he sold seven to eight sheet music songs per show, every show. Is that from before Tin Pan Alley? And yes, oh, before yeah. Tin Pan Alley really got started. He, and he also made Tam Switmark. Tam Whitmark, uh, Isidore Whitmark said, oh, golly gee, you're a perfect person for me to hook up with. And Isidore became his primary publisher uh, through the years. But, and he made Isidore Whitmark a ton of money. Um, he's a conductor. And he conducted absolutely, oh, I know one thing before we get to conducting, he was in one of the more famous New York. He helped start one of the more famous New York string quartets. <laughs> he, so he was, an, he was a um, chamber, music chamber music player okay, as a performer. Now, from a conducting standpoint, he had conducted. He had an orchestra when he was in Europe. He came over here, and he immediately started playing for Theodore Thomas and uh, Walter Damrosch. And in um, the Met. And in the Met. And soon he was assistant conducting. And his first big job caused him a some problems because he became the band director of Gilmore's band. And oh my God, a band director. Who did he think he was? And, and especially when not long, within two years, three years after becoming a band director, he was, he was named the conductor of the Pittsburgh Orchestra. 
And that really caused problems. Oh my goodness, how can they hire a band director to direct the orchestra? So he was an orchestra director, he was a band director. He conducted his almost every opening night of his operettas. And even more spectacularly, he orchestrated everything he wrote. Now, for those of you who might not understand what that means, that means that he would stand, you're going to see a lovely desk that, that Loris will tell you all about. But when, you, when he talks about that desk, Herbert would sit there at the desk with orchestra scores, which are, what, 12 lines? No, at least, at maybe 12, 17 or 18. 15, 17 lines. And he would write the orchestra score as he went. He composed for the orchestra immediately. He didn't sit down at the piano and play a tune, he and then as he, he orchestrated mm -hmm. as he composed. And, the piano desk, the piano. And, mm -hmm. and for the most part, the, the piano was always yeah. there, but the desk, but he was doing it at his desk. Um, this guy is the predecessor. He's the only American composer who orchestrated his own work, I believe. I think Kurt Weill orchestrated his work, but for sure, Leonard Bernstein did not, even though he said he did. <laughs> and Sondheim certainly doesn't. And Sondheim well, and, doesn't? No. And uh, just to add to that, part of that is, is usually the composer is so busy working on the show that way, and orchestrating is a time-consuming project, and Herbert was so facile at it that he could do it. Plus, he was so fussy about it, he didn't want other people doing it. And composers, we were talking about the young composers, if you would ask him, the Kerns, the Berlins, the Gershwins, all that, they admired Herbert because of this beautiful music that he wrote, but also his scoring, that they, he could make an orchestra and the pit just sound glorious that way. And that and was one can, of his things. You have a question. You said 17 lines. Are those different lines for different instruments? Different instruments. So you'd, yeah. you know, your flutes and oboes and clarinets yeah. down the way. Yeah. Are you saying Bernstein didn't orchestrate his symphonies? I'm not oh, no, sure about that's his concert symphonies. Music. That's concert music. Okay, yeah. we're talking about theater West Side music. Story? West Side Story was no. not. No, no, he did he, not. And most, most composers don't. Richard Rodgers didn't. It's just something you don't have time for uh, when you're they writing. They all a show. relied on Robert Russell Bennett, mm -hmm. who l kind of learned from Herbert and Frank Sadler. Frank Sadler did a yes. lot of uh, mu early musical comedy uh, orchestrations, but Herbert did his own. And because of that, when you listen to a Herbert score played with an orchestra, you are constantly surprised. You are constantly delighted by the sounds. And I've even had musicians say, maestro, that can't be right. Let's play it again. Oh, it is right. It's just different. He just was an absolute genius at scoring. To a certain extent, he was almost a Mozart. It was certainly almost his, his memory was Mozart that way. Orchestrate all his own yes, and <laughs> as he wrote. And he certainly produced just yes. out of his head on the table. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's conducting, he's never failing at anything that he's doing. But then he gets into the championing the composer in America. Puccini came over here uh, for Girl of the Golden West and said, oh my God, you don't have a copyright law that deals with recordings and things like that. And the next thing we know, um, the agent that was dealing with Puccini is talking to Nathan Burkhan, who says, well, you got to get Victor on it. OK, you got to get Victor. And Victor and John Phillip <laughs> and, and, Irving Smith, and, and eventually Kern and a whole bunch of other people spent two solid years lobbying down here for mechanical rights for the composer. Mechanical rights are your recording rights. And there's a wonderful story about him walking into a restaurant. Uh, it wasn't the famous Shandley uh, situation, but he walked into a restaurant and say they were throwing a party for Herbert and they thought they would surprise him and the, the, orchestra, the restaurant owner brought out a big Victrola and played a famous Herbert song. And Herbert walked over and picked it up and threw it on the floor <laughs> because he had no idea about that. Who was making money on recording his material that he hadn't authorized? So Herbert did that. 
And then after that, he went the next step and he insisted on ASCAP being formed. ASCAP is the American Society of Composers, um, authors, authors and, publishers. and publishers. The night that they started the show, it was a major thunderstorm. They invited 50 guys to come to Lou Chow's on 14th Street in New York. And it was horrible rainy night and nobody showed up except seven guys. And, and they all said, well, we got to put it off. But let's have dinner and go home. And Herbert said, nope, we came here to do it. We're going to do it. And he and the, the six other guys uh, formed ASCAP, and then about what, six months later, it was two, uh, I think it was 1914, they had another meeting that 100 people showed up at, and ASCAP was officially started. And ASCAP still runs very well today, thank you, and protects the, the mechanical rights of the composer. Um, I think that's a reason to care about Victor Herbert. And I think if you really delve down in your minds, I don't think you can come up with another American figure in music or entertainment who did as much for the changing of the game as Victor Herbert did. Don't think there's anybody else. This is what the changing of the game is what I've been thinking of, having uh, grown up young with uh, Herbert and and loving those operettas. And then lately, always hearing that either Oklahoma, <coughs> sometimes Shobo, were the, were the big change. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> they had the songs that matched the story. And that's not the way I remember it. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that as I look at Game Changers, and, and I'm ex beginning to explore this whole thing as part of my own research, you know, Oscar Hammerstein II wrote Shobo. And Oscar Hammerstein II is a Game Changer. And the reason he is is because he's the first of the fine American librettists. Before Oscar Hammerstein II, we had none. The ones that we had were Henry Blossom, who worked with Herbert. We had Harry B. Smith writing over 300 operettas, but he wasn't very good. He was a great lyric writer. You sing the lyrics that Harry B. Smith wrote a lot, but was he a good librettist? No. The first really good librettists were two Brits, P.J. Woodhouse and Guy Bolton, who came over and did the Princess Theater shows with Jerome Kern. But they were Brits. It was Oscar Hammerstein II was the first American. And that's why everybody fixates on Showboat, 1927. Did Herbert Harry B. Smith, Henry Blossom, two women. Ryda Johnson Young is responsible for the single most famous Herbert ever written, which is Naughty Marietta. <laughs> Um, and, and Naughty Marietta is a wonderful tale for, a, I could spend hours talking about Naughty Marietta because it came out of a disaster. The disaster that we'll talk about in a few minutes, make sure I don't run over in time, mm -hmm. because it came out of the ashes of Natoma. And we're going to talk about Natoma in a, in a few minutes. But that's where Naughty Marietta came from. Natoma died the first time in March of, two, of 1910. Naughty Marietta opened in November of 1910. It did not exist in March, April, and May. Ryder Johnson Young got, got recommended by Isidore Whitmark. She wrote that show entirely. Herbert wrote that show entirely from June to August or September. Naughty Marietta, probably the most classic American operetta in existence. And a good libretto. I think it's a good And libretto. a very good yeah, libretto. I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the difference between a composer and, and an arranger? Ah, good question. I spent, um, I, will, I, will, I write a, a newsletter, and that question bugged me a lot, so I explored that whole thing this year. A composer writes everything about the piece of music, okay? He writes the melody, and he writes how it's played. 
an arranger goes to a guy who can only write the melody and writes everything else for him. Many so, composers write the harmonies. Pardon? Many composers write the harmonies. That's what yeah. I said, though. But that's no. That's why I said the composer the controls the way it sounds. Right. Okay. Now, I like to say that a lot of people, including Irving Berlin, was a tunesmith more than he was a composer because he couldn't take the melody any further than his, his piano and his, his one or two fingers could do, all right? An arranger comes in and writes the piano version. An orchestrator comes in and writes the, the orchestra version and fills out what, every, what it sounds like. And it always bugged me because a composer controls what he's, what's in his head. And if you have to have an orchestrator, yes, you can talk and you can give suggestions, but you can't totally control what's in your head. You have to rely on that other guy. And Robert Russell Bennett was an absolute genius at serving Richard Rogers and, and Jerome Kern and everybody, of Lerner and Lowe, everybody. He made them sound like they were. And just a quick... Berlin story in this thing. You know, we all know that Irving Berlin had a very minimal education in music, and he, he played the black keys on the piano. So he had a piano that, that he called the Buick that would adjust, and he could always play in the black keys, but it would move the, the, uh, the, the tune, the tone center of the piece wherever he needed it to go. And Robert Russell Bennett talks about sitting with him because Robert Russell Bennett would act as his secretary, because Irving did not know how to notate down what he had written. He didn't know how to write down the music, so Robert Russell Bennett would act as his secretary and write down what he played. And uh, they would work for hours, and Irving would try this and try this, and Bennett had studied in France with Nadia Boulanger, and he'd say, well, Irving, maybe you need this chord here and play a, a diminished seventh chord or some something like that. And Irving said, no, that's not what I want. Don't bother me. And he would do that. And Robert Russell Bennett said that after hours of doing this, Berlin found the right chord that made the song not a good song, but a great song. And he said, I never would have thought to have found that chord for that thing. And Berlin was an, an enormous admirer of Herbert and, and just worshipped him. And he came to Herbert at one point and he said, would you give me music lessons? And Herbert said, Absolutely not. He said, you have something that can't be taught. And the, the worst thing I could do is wreck this wonderful gift that you have. You just go on writing the way you do, because no one else can write Irving Berlin songs. So. You know, they wrote a show together. Uh, in 1916, uh, Ziegfeld and um, his huge rival, Charles B. Dillingham, came together and decided they would out Ziegfeld Follies themselves. And they wrote, they hired Irving Berlin and Victor Herbert, Henry Blossom, and Berlin wrote his own lyrics, and they wrote a show called The Century Girl. You're gonna hear some music from The Century Girl tonight. And it was not about centuries, it was about the Century Theater, which was at the time one of the largest theaters in New York City, and it was way up north at 62nd and Central Park West. If you've been in New York and you know where the Century Apartments are, then That's... you know where the Century Theater was. And they wrote together, and one of my, one, my favorite Irving Berlin stories is that uh, Herbert came in to play the music that he'd written for some of the big production numbers, and Irving Berlin said, you know, I wasn't really all that impressed. He said, it was okay, but it certainly wasn't anything big and wonderful. And he said, then um, when the orchestra came, and Herbert lifted his arms, and that orchestra played, he said, my God, it was like manna from heaven. Just amazing, and that's where that relationship started. Was on the Century Girl. Um, really, a really nice thing. You suppose we should take some time and talk about um, revivals and restoration? Sure, where we absolutely. Are? Now, um, to start, one quick thing I want to interject because I, I know this is a question I'll get when it's all over and people didn't ask. 
and it's a question I get all the time, what is an operetta? You know, it, it, it's, it's not that difficult. It's, a, it's a, a musical, it's a precursor to what we think of as our musical now. But it's a play that has songs in between with spoken dialogue. Most of the operettas we're talking about come out of the tradition of the European operettas, which might be Johann Strauss. It also comes out of Jacques Offenbach and some of those, and it just kind of transfers. And that was sort of the precursor. Oh, Gilbert and Sullivan is another one. So you'd have songs, but then you'd have talking in between, whereas an opera generally is a sung from beginning to end sort of thing. Even the spots where people might be in a play talking. Uh, Ned Roramari says that if he was writing an, uh, an, an operetta, he would say, pardon me, ma'am, while I use the lavatory. And if he was writing an opera, they would say, I'm going to the restroom. So that's, that's sort of how you d make the differentiation the there. In Herbert's case, yeah. he always had to have at least a treatment mm -hmm. or the book. Yeah. Herbert did. You know, here's an interesting thing about Herbert and his operettas. He never initiated a single project. Never. Except Madeline, which mm. was an opera. Yeah. He never initiated it. The producer would come to Victor and say, Victor, Vic. I, I need a show. Well, who's going to write the book? And nine times out of ten, it was Harry B. Smith. Um, and then he discovered um, Henry Blossom Henry with Mademoiselle Modiste in 1905, 1906, somewhere right. And 1905. Don't Glenn McDonough, who did the big show, Babes in Toyland. Babes in Toyland. He's a very important guy. Yes, and who was one of the founders of ASCAP. Of ASCAP. Um, but Herbert didn't initiate, and he did not go out and hire librettists. He did not go out and hire stage managers. He did not go out and hire set people. He simply wrote music. Did the librettists work with Herbert the way like I wrote work with George? No. No. Not, they would write their libretto stuff, yeah. and he would come. Now, the sad thing is, is that he never found his Gilbert. But the reason he never found his Gilbert was because there wasn't a Gilbert in America. There really wasn't. Henry Blossom was the closest. And quite honestly, Ryder Johnson Young wrote the best libretto going. There's nothing wrong with Naughty Marietta. Mm -hmm. That one is a very strong story. And it's got angst and, and conflict in it and great stuff in it. And the men could never figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. They were always simply telling exotic stories. Mm -hmm. But to go one step further is What's the difference between operetta and musical comedy? There's one and only one real difference. You have to be able to sing to sing an operetta. You have to have a voice. Yeah. Musical comedy, you don't have to have a voice. Uh, Rex Harrison proved you can talk Talked it. his way okay? through. And Herbert did not always write operetta. Sweethearts is just between, but, but they're not great voices in necessarily in Sweethearts. Red Mill is yeah. a musical comedy. Yeah. There's Red no Mill. way that Red Mill is an operetta. Was that distinction a conscious one? Or is that you know why? No, was because the producer came, and who was the producer? If the producer was a musical comedy guy, he would bring musical comedy people. And in some cases, he was musical comedy. There's a wonderful Cyrano de Bergerac that was written in 1899, one year after the play opened in Paris. It was commissioned, produced, and starred Francis Wilson, who was a vaudevillian. <laughs> so he decided that Cyrano was, was a bumpkin, and everybody lived. <laughs> Herbert wrote it. He wrote some gorgeous music. It's probably one of the most gorgeous scores you've never heard. It's gorgeous music, but it definitely was a huge failure. I think it lasted 28 performances and then was gone. And fortunately, that book got lost a long, long time ago. So that when we restored it, um, we took the score, which was doable, and went back to the Rostan story and told the story the way it's supposed to be. And the 11 o'clock song, when everybody was still alive, 
We used it as the balcony scene because there was no balcony scene. How can you do a Cyrano with no balcony scene? Uh, um, one of my friends, uh, Suzanne, back there said, "How can you do? How can you do um, Romeo and Juliet without a balcony scene?" <laughs> But, but let's talk about how we've brought about, we're in the midst of a wonderful revival of Victor Herbert. And, and I like to hope that I've had a, a, a fairly strong hand in it. Um, I came to Victor Herbert through Babes in Toyland. I got asked by um, Dino Anagnost and the Little Orchestra Society to write a new Babes in Toyland. And, and I didn't know Victor Herbert from a hole in the wall, honest to gosh. A new one? A, yeah, a new store, a new libretto. Um, and the first time I went to the studio rehearsal and heard the orchestra play, and I thought, this is the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my entire life. And I came down and, and I told Wayne, and Wayne said to me, he said, okay, you've done Babes in Toyland. Everybody does Babes in Toyland. You want to do something for Herbert? And he took me, this is when the Herbert collection was still on the same, it was still on the, the first floor, it hadn't gone down to the vault yet. And he, he took me into this room that was about half of this size. All the way around the outside edges and in the center, up to the ceiling, boxes and boxes and boxes. And he said, you want to do something for Victor Herbert? This is Victor Herbert and nobody cares and nobody knows. And I went to the foundation, and the Victor Herbert Foundation didn't care. It was in the hands of a 94, at that time, year old guy who said, nobody <coughs> cares about Victor Herbert. He was giving all his money to, to seeing eye dogs and, and Boy Scouts and all of this. And we convinced him. I can, first of all, I had to convince my maestro that there was something here. And we could have a lot of fun. He'd been doing Vivaldi for years. He'd done Vivaldi up to here, as far as I was concerned. And I said, why don't you become a Victor Herbert Orchestra? And he decided to do Fortune Teller, which was in awful shape. I cannot even begin to tell you the shape of that, that sh show, orchestra-wise. We did Fortune Teller, and the audiences loved it. Alice Tully Hall, Sally Ann Howe, we had six singers, a full chorus, a full or professional orchestra, and it was dynamite. The next year, we decided to do Cyrano, which made the fortune teller parts look beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the fortune teller parts were coming from Tams Whitmark. They were 100 years old. They had been <laughs> rented I don't know how many times, and they were in awful shape, been cut, and, and just awful shape. And the Cyrano parts were more than 100 years old and had never been played, but were still in awful shape. Did you have Herbert's original manuscripts? Yes, yes. Never, ever, well, no, not in the case of Fortune Teller. Fortune Teller's the, o the only famous one in which there's hardly a score in existence. So that, those parts have been recreated, and they are coming from the Tams Whitmark touring parts. That's all we had. But in the case of Cyrano, we have the original scores. And actually, as we speak, they are being finalized in a computerized version. The next show we did was Mademoiselle Modiste. And I met a guy named Bruce Herman who said, I want to computerize it. And I will do the work. And I said, I will help you get all the scores if you will let us use the parts. So when we did Mademoiselle Modiste, which I think was 2000, 2001, we had computerized parts, and my orchestra was not ready to kill me. When we did Cyrano, the orchestra said, if you put one more of those things on our stands, we're going to revolt. Why on earth do you want to do this awful stuff? Well, they were having such a hard time reading the parts that they were not caring about what they were putting out music-wise. When we did Mademoiselle Modiste, everything changed. So we started. I had convinced my maestro that we had something going, and by the time um, he passed away a year ago, a year and a half, uh, and we have now done, we did eight shows. Um, so we have those eight shows. Uh, after he, after I left working, for, I worked for his orchestra for a while, and after I left there, I had tried to get Rogers and Hammerstein to publish my stuff. And Rogers and Hammerstein could never figure out how to make money. So they kept saying, no, 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 no. And I thought, this revival isn't going to happen until people can play the music. 
and people have access to the music. So after I left the, working for the orchestra, I had this little thing go off in my head, and I thought, digital. Everything needs to be PDF'd and available. And I started a business, VH Source, and one of my happiest moments was within four months of being open, Paris called at 6.30, no, Paris emailed me at 6.30 one morning and said, we are in dire need of the prima donna song. Do you have the prima donna song? Which is actually artists calling for me, which is you are also going to hear tonight. And I said, sure, I have it. And I said, all you have to do is da 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 And 30 minutes later, they had their music in Paris, ready to print out the original Herbert version. Absolutely incredible. Do you rent No, I sell them because it's public domain material. And $45, and you can have it, and you'll keep it. Or you can throw it away if you want to. Now, I'm in the process of beginning to rent my librettos, which are not public domain. They're, they're copyrighted, but they all work. And they've been done by people like Lynn Redgrave. So you know Lynn Redgrave is not going to do a piece of, of, of libretto that doesn't work. And, and neither is Estelle Parsons. Um, and I had great, great success with those people. So that's what we're doing. And I now have about six guys. Interestingly enough, they're guys. Ladies haven't started doing this yet but who computerize stuff. And as we speak right now, the following shows, let's see, the following shows have been done. Um, Fortune Teller has been done by a guy named Adam Aceto out in California and has been played by Ohio Light Opera, as well as a, a place in, in Michigan. Um, Sweethearts has been done. Red Mill has been done. Naughty Marietta has been done. Eileen has been done. The Magic Knight, which is a one-act spoof of Lohengrin, has been done. <laughs> um, what else has been done? I don't know if I've missed anything. Um, Babes in Toyland. Babes in Toyland is a whole different question. Babes in Toyland has been completely done and not allowed to be shared, so we are doing it again. No, um, the guy who originally commissioned it, it will not talk to anybody, will not share, so we are doing Babes in Toyland again. Um, as we speak right now, the following shows are underway. Madeline is almost done. That's a one-act opera. Um, the Serenade is underway. The Serenade is the first masterpiece in 1896. 97, maybe, 97, I think. Very, there's a Harry B. Smith that works. Got to do questions, too. Oh, got to do questions, too. Up, okay. So. so, the Serenade. Cyrano de Bergiac is on the way to being done. Um, and Natoma. Natoma is two thirds of the way done. It's his grand opera. And that is, I will take four minutes to talk about Natoma. Natoma was not very well received when it happened. It um, was not understood. It starred Mary Garden. It was an American operetta set in California with an American Indian, a, a native Indian, Spanish. Um, it is an opera. Full opera. Yeah. It's a full grand opera. It lasts a good three hours. It's a three act opera. It has some glorious music in it. Um, its libretto got absolutely creamed. The poor guy who wrote it didn't write again for a long time. He eventually did write again, but he, it, got, it got negative reviews. Um, we, uh, Glenn Clugston and I came down to the Library of Congress where all of it resides and spent three days putting it in order. And then in 2011, um, a guy who put on a concert celebrating 150 years of Willow Grove Amusement Park fell in love with Herbert and he computerized the choral portion of the Act Three, and he fell in love with it. And I somehow convinced him to do the whole thing. Now he's primarily doing it for free, 
Most of my people work for free. They're doing it out of love. But I've got a team now of uh, Peter Hilliard, who lives in the Willow Grove area. He's doing the computerization. Glenn Clugston, who is a retired music director uh, and um, a touring uh, music director in New York, is doing all the proofing. Dan Patano from uh, Philadelphia area is marketing and looking for an orchestra. Um, the goal is in 2014 to do the whole thing as written in a weekend. On a Friday, we will rehearse the orchestra. The orchestra can also have the parts as long ahead as they want. On Saturday, we'll add the voices, and on Sunday, we'll add people to sit and listen and tell us what they like and what they don't like, where they get lost. In other words, let's let this wonderful, the most important opera written before Porgy and Bess has not been heard in 100 years. And where that's you, what we're trying to do. Where are you doing it? Where is New York? No, we're hoping to do it in the Philly area because that's where it opened. And that's a whole big another story. But that's where it opened. And either New York or, or um, Philadelphia or Chicago. Or Chicago. Uh, you mentioned all these different perfect uh, operators. How many of them were done on movies with Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald? I know a lot. Of them. That's what my husband did. Well, now, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject right here. Because that was Herbert. I don't want to go. I don't no. want to hear them. There, there are four or five of those shows that did that. That was Herbert's daughter. Oh. Ella Herbert was Victor Herbert's daughter. And when he died, he didn't really leave much money. He had sort of an Irish will. They read it out and said, sorry, there's nothing left. I drank all the money. <laughs> <laughs> and she took a very small inheritance from her father. And her main goal was to keep her father's music in the public eye. And she was not a purist because she said, I don't need to be a purist. The point is to keep this music in front of, in front of the public. Just like we see the Gershwin family now is saying, look, we've been keeping Porgy and Best a pure opera all these years. And they said, pure is great, but no one's listening to it. No one's performing it. So she said, here's this wonderful vehicle of this beautiful Jeanette McDonald and this handsome Nelson Eddy to keep this music alive, and they gave it to Hollywood. And don't forget that the first MGM color musical was not The Wizard of Oz. The year before, their first color musical was Sweethearts, a full year before MGM. And I still meet a lot of people that for them, that's their Victor Herbert. And you have to respect that. Well, they sure has changed the story. So oh, my goodness. goodness. Oh, oh, yeah. And but, not to mention the fact that Nelson Eddy wasn't a tenor. Well, you know, and the other thing is, so you think about this, is how many here have attended and seen all of the Gershwin musicals? Oh, they haven't all been. That's right. Most, most people don't even know what the Gershwin musicals were because we had this wonderful music that came from it. And for some people, they don't need the show. At least now you can buy. That's right. I mean, it, it's, it's part, of the, part of the vernacular, but the music is so good that it doesn't need the show. You don't need to know where Swonderful came from to enjoy Swonderful. You don't need to know the, babes, the original Babes in Toyland to almost get teary when you hear Toyland, when you're walking through the mall. I mean, we're almost at Christmas time. Now is the great big Herbert revival with the yeah. March of the Toys in yeah. Toyland. Yeah. So. And so none it's, of it's the a, books. We don't ever pretend that Herbert had no. was out there with good librettos. Yeah. He wasn't, which is why I do what I do. Yeah. Are you rewriting the book and the libretto? The book is the libretto. Yeah. What I don't do is I do my best not so to do redo story. lyrics. Yeah. Uh -huh. we, we, and we don't change a note of Herbert's music. We and, may shorten it down. And we probably should ask some questions yes. quick because I have to go open up my Irish whiskey on stage so, <laughs> and let it breathe a little bit before the concert. So if you have any questions, we'd... Oh, yeah. Yes. What? Oh, I'm Excuse me. Then oh, I would. Oh, Where's the other woman? Did you say there were two? You... Oh, yeah. Fred DeGrigiac. Mm -hmm. I'll say, I know there was Dorothy Donnelly. Fred... Donna, maybe, maybe she didn't work with Herbert. ...is actually Frederica. She was from Paris, and she was married to a very famous, and I can't think of his name. I, his name always slips away from me, but a very famous baritone with the French opera. 
And that's how she got here. Which one did she do? Which ones did she do? She, she did orange blossoms. Oh, yeah. And she did um, portions of Red Mill. Oh. She, in fact, where she first started working with Herbert, if you know Red Mill, there's a wonderful scene two-thirds of the way through the first act where there's an accident between a French woman and an English barrister. And the French woman speaks all in French the entire scene. And that's where Fred de Grigiac started working with Herbert. So. Um, you can't be using the term book and then libretto or something? What, what do those mean? A book is the same thing as a libretto. The, the real terms are libretto and lyrics. In other words, the words that go with the songs and then the words that are spoken. So a libretto or book are the words that are spoken. And you might, and to clarify that a little more, you might, uh, for Oklahoma's green grows my... Green, uh, green, green grow the lilacs. That was a book. And, and they saw this book and they said, boy, that'd make a good play or something. From that book, a, dra a dramatic person took that and condensed it down, just like a, a screenwriter would condense down. You couldn't put a whole book on stage or something because it'd be yeah. 90 hours long. Um, so the libretto is created from that book. And then generally another person, but it can be the other, it's same person, would write the lyrics for the songs. And that's sort of the poet that comes up with, uh, you know, Old Man River, the lyrics for that. Sometimes they're different people. Sometimes it's one person, you know, that way. You said earlier that Noli Marietta came out of a tragedy? Yes. <laughs> Natoma. 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 Oscar <coughs> Hammerstein I promised <coughs> Herbert and hired Herbert to write the first American grand opera. He promised, he wanted Herbert to do it, Herbert wanted to do it. Um, it was, he, Herbert was under contract and Herbert finished it in December of 1909. And Oscar Hammerstein I promised to produce it by February of 1910. By February of 1910 he was broke and his, his um, son Arthur actually sent him overseas to get him out of the way, went to the Met. Be, uh, just a little bit of quick background. The, the Manhattan Opera Company that Oscar started was running the Met out of business, even though the Met had Caruso. He's running them into the ground. Everybody was losing money, but Oscar spent money faster than he made it. So he, so Arthur sent Oscar out of town, he sent him over to England, and he met with the Met, and he said, look, get, make me an offer, and I'll make Dad go away. <laughs> Honest to God, quarter of a, a, a million point two five dollars, the Met paid Arthur and Oscar to make Arthur go away, or uh, Oscar go away for 10 years. <laughs> and Oscar took the money and went to London and built an opera house. And Arthur, Arthur produced Naughty Marietta because he had a really angry composer on his hands. Because all of a sudden the grand opera Natoma was dead in the water. Because Oscar and Arthur could not produce opera for 10 years. So here you have, and, and someday I'm going to write a play about this because this is probably the most TNT moment. I can just see Victor Herbert bouncing off of the walls because his opera was gone. And the only way, and I'm sure Arthur said to good friend Isidore, What in the heck are we going to do to shut him up? He's madder than hell. And Isidore said, Vic, why don't you write a really great operetta? And I happen to have a gal working for me in librettos, Ryda Johnson Young, who I think would be really good for you. November, Naughty Marietta opened. And there is no better American operetta, bar none. You mentioned that Paris called. Paris called, wanted a, a, a Victor Herbert song, right? Did he have, uh, what, do you have any idea what they were using that song for, what they wanted well, it a for? Concert. A concert. A concert. Just and an individual piece having of concert. worked for a maestro who was always doing things last minute, 
Maestros love to do that. Okay, they drive their orchestra it. librarian crazy. <laughs> they say, oh, so-and-so is coming. What would you like to sing, honey? <laughs> oh, I know how to do the Italian street song. Well, we don't have that. Well, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So they say to the orchestra librarian, go find Get it. it. Yeah. And fortunately, I have it. <laughs> I'm the, and I'm the only place in the entire world where in 10 minutes, you, you can, can get an original Herbert score and parts. I'll have to remember that. <laughs> no. um, did he have a big, big following in Europe when he was alive and no. running these things? No. No. He was an, an American phenomena. Okay. A, he didn't, he didn't go about it. Now, remember Herbert's an Irishman. Bleeds green. To get into the, where is the big center of, of American musical where the, the, uh, the musical singers where the comedy is coming from, it's all coming out of England. Herbert had zero tolerance and time for anything English. No, I mean, this is, this is turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And a true Irish patriot would have nothing. He conducted there once. And I think just because of his bad feelings towards the British, you know, because of the political right. mood between the Irish and coming from a family of, of patriots that way, it really was a hard entree for him to get in. And remember that, that this is early in American history where uh, the Europeans, Europeans did not expect too much from those Americans. So, so it, it's definitely a, an American thing. I've done a lot of orchestra concerts in Europe and it passed out a Herbert piece on an orchestra program and they're like, where did you find this composer? This is wonderful music. It's, it's almost as good as Johann Strauss. <laughs> and so for them, it, it's always kind of a fun thing because they don't know this music at all. So The interesting, so. Thing, the re interesting thing is that in World War I, you know, World War I started in 1914. We didn't get involved until 19, what, 17? 17. 17. Through that whole three-year period, Victor Herbert was the voice of the I and, and guess who he wanted to win? The Germans. Uh -oh. And let because me tell the you, the because American. He school there, in school there? No, 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 because because he didn't like because the he so wanted much. the Germans to beat the, the British, English the so that the English yeah. would leave Ireland alone. Yeah. And he was the voice, and he got himself in a ton of trouble. Yeah. And in fact, hurt one of his best scores, Eileen, which opened in 1917. Um, he hurt that score because he was so adamantly pro German. He wasn't pro German, he was just so darn anti English. I think that's a better way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more and then we've got to go. Um, question I had I've conducted the, uh, the opera. But, um, uh, I've conducted uh, his, his one act opera. Uh, Which one, Madeline? Madeline. Oh, yes. And oh, I, wonderful. I, I've, I've done several, I did four performances of it. And I did it with orchestra. Mm -hmm. Now, I got the orchestration from the library of the Metropolitan Opera. Mm -hmm. Well, it's handwritten, right? Exactly. Well, that's handwritten. what we're doing, is we're computerizing it. Oh, good. So it'll because, be absolutely gorgeous. Good. Thank you very much, because we had one hell of a time <laughs> dealing with those parts. <laughs> because, you know, they did it at the Met. And yes, but you know where there's a better set? Where? Right here at the library. Right here. Yeah. Well, In fact, do you know where you can buy a set right now? From you? Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, when I did it, there was no you or you. I mean, you know, this was like, what, eight years ago when I did it. Uh, here in, in Arlington, Virginia. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I did four performances of it, and I had the orchestration from the Met, and these were the parts that were used. I can't think of the name of this, this Italian uh, that... Uh, yeah, 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 could, yeah. Uh, the guy who was head in the Met at the time. Yeah, he, could, yeah. He, and he and it had all of his additions in it, and the parts were dreadful. Yeah. So they if, handwritten. If you're, if you're doing, if you're doing this, thank you because it's a lovely piece. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I have for sale right now that you can download in ten minutes. I thank have you. a good handwritten set that came from here. That's terrific. Because but I'm doing it again. My guy, my guy will hopefully get off his little took us and finish the computerized version, and then you can buy it and keep it. Oh, that's good. That'll be good because you know because it, it, it deserves to be done. It's a nice opera. Oh, it opera. does. It's a beautiful opera. We did it in a double bill with the uh, with the Secret of Suzanne, Emanuel mm -hmm. Ferrari. Yeah. Well, it's a black box experimental opera, isn't it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And he it, he was doing what Kern was trying to do with the Princess Theater. Okay. Yeah. yeah that makes yeah. sense. But we had good singers, and we and we did it, and people loved it. And the, the first question was, 
where the, what the hell is this opera? Because they didn't know that he had even written it. Well, you should you should pair it up with the Magic Knight, which is the spoof of which is Lohengrin. Which Lohengrin? Yes, I know. And is absolutely hysterically funny. And those parts are done computerized and up on the site. I may take. Everybody I may, needs to I go may take see you up on that. vhsource.com. And with that said, <laughs> go into the Coolidge Auditorium and enjoy tonight's concert. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.